Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Monday Night Live. So excited to get to come to you guys tonight. We've got a special call plan. You're going to get to hear from, uh, not me all night long, you're going to get to hear from some top enrollers, some up and coming leaders. Um, and I am really super excited. But before I get in, I want to just remind you guys of a couple of announcements. We have the Watch Me Grow incentive. How many of you are on your way to earning this Apple Watch? Drop in the chat how many joins you already have towards your six. So if you've already gotten a couple of joins this month, shout that out in the chat. Um, look at you guys. Okay, perfect. So somebody said to me earlier, they're like, we're halfway through the month. I'm a little nervous. I wanted to be further along. Let me just tell you, it's really totally normal for a lot of your joints to come the second half of the month. So you're still in this. There is still plenty of time in this month to make that watch happen, to earn that Apple watch. You either have to enroll six people or you can enroll three and help one of those three enroll three. So tell people, every person that you're enrolling, make sure that they know what is at their fingertips. So plenty of time for that to happen. I'm super excited to see what you guys come up with there. All right, so the topic tonight, if you saw on the graphic was overcoming limiting beliefs that you might have as you're sharing Plexus, and then overcoming common objections that you might get from people as you're sharing Plexus. So this business is 80% mindset, meaning only 20% of what you're going to need to build a massive organization here is skill set. And by this point, we've gotten a lot of the skill set systems and techniques and tips and tricks all worked out for you. Like we have fallen on our faces many times through the years. Um, and what that does is it presents you a unique opportunity to come in with some well thought out skill set that we can teach and model for you. So 80% of it is going to be what you're telling yourself between your ears, what you're believing, um, how your thoughts and beliefs are affecting your actions, which of course will affect your results. So um, I thought I would start with a story that many of you don't know. Sometimes when you see a diamond, who is generally more put together than I am tonight, um, you tend to think, oh my gosh, she has pixie dust sprinkled all over her. Everything she touches turns to joins, um, like she's just magical or whatever. And most of you weren't around when I came around to begin with, six and a half years ago. Most of you were not here. But here is something that might surprise you. When I started Plexus, I jumped in all in because remember, I had told Brittany no for a year. For a solid year, I had told her no. I had ignored her. I had not participated. But when I decided I was going to do this, I was going to do this. And so I jumped in and hit the ground running. I immediately started consistent IPA. I immediately was engaging in consistent conversations. I immediately was posting um, consistently. I was doing everything that it takes to build this. And I was working hard. I was teaching full time. I had just had a third baby. Uh, I was really making this a priority. And about three and a half weeks in, I called Brittany and I said, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. I don't think I can do this. No one has joined me. I don't understand. Like I'm doing what, you're, you, what you said it would take to be successful. I'm doing the things you're telling me to do. It's not working. No one has joined me yet. I'm almost a month in and I can't even go silver. And this was with me working really hard really hard. So she, of course, did not look at my present results that day. She could have looked and said, Christina's not producing anything. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I was wrong about her. Maybe she doesn't have what it takes. Um, it's not what she did. She instead looked at my effort and my potential. And she decided, I mean, you know what? She's showing up. She's putting in some work and I I'm going to determine where I think she could be, not look at where she's currently at. And so she just poured belief into me. She repeatedly told me like, you're going to get better. We're going to figure this out. Some of the times she would say, Christina, it's just a numbers game. You're going to find your people. Just don't stop digging. There's gold bricks in your backyard. You just got to find them. And she offered, she would give me feedback on what I was doing. She'd say, okay, what are you doing? What did you say to this person? And I would tell her and she would say, okay, well, when you said this, Here's maybe what I would have said instead. Or she would say, hey, listen, why did you decide to go that route with that message versus this route? 
She made sure I was plugged into trainings. She would say, listen, go, go read something that's going to build you up. And so I would go listen to a podcast or whatever she suggested. Um, but my point in telling you that story is you guys see results, but you don't see the years that I spent with scraped up knees and bent up elbows. And so many times that I would hit push for a goal and not get it. And I don't say that to discourage any of you guys. I say that because as long as you get back up, you can be exactly where you see us today. The only difference between me and some of the people who joined around the same time I did was the willingness to have the scraped knees, the willingness to have that scab busted off over and over and over again, and to just decide to trust the process, trust the leaders, look at the people who have been there and decide, I'm just going to do what they say, even if I don't have the results yet to show for it, because she believes I can change and improve and grow. And so I'm just going to believe that too. Even if I don't feel it, I'm going to go off of what I believe can be true. So um, we're going to talk tonight about what it takes to get to that place. And you're going to hear from people who are right where you at. One of the people that you're going to hear from tonight is a senior gold. One is a Ruby. Um, and I just want you to hear multiple perspectives about some of these limiting beliefs and these objections, because whether this is you and you're in the, the beginning stages of this, or whether you have people in the beginning stages, the most important thing is to never, ever give up on someone's potential. If they are presenting a problem with you, know that most of the time, if it is a skill set, it's usually easily rectified, but most of the time it's a mindset and it's a limiting belief. And you as their leader, you have power if you're willing to pour that belief into them repeatedly, not necessarily based off of results that they have, but based off of the efforts that they're putting forth and the potential that they have for the future. So that being said, um, go ahead and say, hi, Laurel. This is Laurel. She's um, on my team. She's an hi. educator. There she is. Hi, Laurel is a Ruby. Um, a funny story about Laurel is when she started this business, she had no social media, none. Like, I don't mean she wasn't present on social media. Like she didn't post often. I mean, homegirl did not own a Facebook, not a single thing. And she always said, when I go Ruby, I'll start one. When I go Ruby, I'll start one. So anytime I have somebody that comes on, like, I couldn't do what you do. I don't have social media. I'm like, let me tell you about my friend Laurel and how much money homegirl was earning before she ever began building on social media. So uh, Laurel, I'm so excited that you're here tonight. I'll start with you with question number one, and then we'll bring in um, Jessa. All right. So before Laurel answers my first question, here's why you should pay attention to what her and Jessa have to say tonight. They are repeatedly on the top and rollers leaderboard and our team page month after month after month. They know what it takes to get people from not open to plexus to open to on board. So I really want you to lean in, pay attention to what they have to say. And if this objection doesn't apply to you specifically, just know it very likely will apply to someone on your team in the future. Okay. So Laurel, a limiting belief that some people have when they're considering doing something like this is this whole idea of, well, if I do that, what will people think of me? Um, and I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like when people decide that they maybe want to share Plexus, but they're held back by this idea that people might think of them a certain way, what do you do? All right. So I really did not struggle with really caring about what people think about me because if they told me no, to me, that just mean, meant not yet. So um, what I did was I borrowed the belief from my leader. My leader is um, Terry. And um, I went to her house one um, afternoon, I think right after she had her back surgery. And I just, I just saw how happier she was and how healthier she looked. And y'all... <laughs> I tell her all the time, her stomach was as flat as I've ever seen it before in my home. We're cousins. So in our lifetime, I'd never seen her stomach that flat. And I said, girl, what are you doing? And she told me a little bit about what she was doing. And so I just borrowed her belief in the products until I had my own testimony, which happened um, right after me starting the products, 30 days after starting the products, I had battled high blood pressure for 
like 15, 16 years. And um, after 30 days of being on the triplex, um, I had low blood pressure. So that's, that's what I did. If, if someone tells me um, that, uh, I lost my notes here. Um, if, if they're scared of what people are going to think about them, then I just say, well, borrow my belief. You know, this is, this is how it worked for me. This is how it worked for my sponsor. This is how it works, worked for my mom. This is how it worked for my best friend. Just, you don't have to have your own testimony right away. Just borrow someone else's belief. Yeah, I love that. So, and, and I think Jessa is going to hit on this in a second. It seems like what you did to kind of take the focus off of what are they going to think about me was you just kind of cared a little bit more about what this could do for them. So because you knew it had helped you with this and Terry with that and me with so-and-so, your focus was more so on what could this do for them? Not so much on the outcome of what will they think of me if I'm sharing? Is that right? That's right. Like, you know, we're a people helping people company. And so, you know, what can this do for you? What can this do for your health? What can this do for your family? Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, perfect. All right. So Jessa is a senior gold on my team, well on her way to Ruby. Um, and a funny story about Jessa is we did not know each other prior to Plexus um, at all. And since then, I've had the chance to work closely with her to help her, you know, kind of reach her goals and um, learn some things and get out of her own way. You know, this is, like I said, mindset's 80% of this. Um, and, and Jessa is definitely a testament of what will happen when you just decide to pursue growth. So Jessa, same question. Um, how did you overcome the idea of what will people think about you if you decided to do this? Or how do you help people on your team who are struggling with this whole, what will they think of me if I decide to share Plexus? Are you at Jessa? I was not unmuted, is where I was at. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, we were just in a test run. So I definitely did not have a good mindset with that at when I first started sharing. I shared because I've truly believed in it. Like I, I did have my own testimony whenever I started sharing. I had been on the products for a year, refusing to do the business when I actually started sharing. So I knew they worked and I believed in them to my core because they worked for me when nothing else would. And I'd already told my parents and they worked for them. And I'd already told my best friend and it worked for her. So I knew how well they worked. And so I didn't have an issue with the products, but I still was very concerned with what would people think of me sharing and how they would, you know, come back at me and say no. And I'm like, okay, well, have a good day. <laughs> Bye. And you're like, no, eight to 10 times. I'm like, mm -mm. they said, no, sorry. <laughs> And then someone wise named Christina told me that you can't think about yourself. That's basically being selfish. You have this, that people are praying for. You have these products that can help people just like they helped me. And if I am being so concerned and caught up in what they think of me, I can't possibly be thinking about them first, which is what you have to do to help them. And when you start thinking about them as your priority, instead of thinking about yourself, it just kind of works itself out. People can feel that, like people genuinely know I'm trying to help them. It is not a numbers game for me. I don't just need you to sign up so that I can make money. I'm here to help you feel the way that I can feel now. And it, it comes across that way when you truly change your mindset. So it's been a, a huge shift for me that has worked very differently than how it was working prior to me thinking like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So what if you don't have results yet uh, on your products? If, if some of you are like, okay, well, that's well and good, but I don't have my own results yet. I wasn't on the products for a year. Like I, maybe I joined just for the opportunity and now I'm getting started on the products. What do I do about this idea of what will people think? And sometimes when I have someone who is struggling with that, I will just let them sit in and I'll say, okay, well, what do you think they could think? Like what Worst case scenario, what might someone think about you? And they'll say, well, you know, I don't want them to think that I'm salesy. And I say, okay, so let's, let's talk about that for a second. 
wh- why would it matter to you if somebody thought you were salty? What, what, like, what feelings does that bring up? And they're like, oh, well, I don't want somebody to think I'm spammy or I'm being sleazy or I'm just out to make a sale. And I'll say, okay, so if you were going to feel that way, what would it take? Like, wh- how would someone have to behave for you to feel these things about them? And of course, they tell me all these, you know, horror stories of, well, you know, telemarketers do this or whatever. And I'll say, okay, how do you want them to feel about you? And then they tell me all these admirable traits. Well, I wanted to know that I'm passionate about what I'm sharing. I wanted to know that I thought of them specifically and I was intentional with my reach out. And I'll say, okay, cool. For you to feel that way about somebody reaching out to you, what would they have to do? And so I just kind of helped them get a realistic picture of for someone to think, man, she's super annoying and pestering. I would have to behave this way. And if I don't behave this way, then they don't have the right to think that about me. But if I want them to think, man, she's passionate about what she believes. She thought of me intentionally. Then I need to do these things. Then all I have to be worried about is doing these things. If I behave this way, then I've set them up to think this about me. Whether or not they actually think that, is none of my business. John Maxwell said, we would be much less concerned about what people thought of us if we knew how rarely they did. Most of the time they're busy worried about what people are thinking about them to sit over there and be thinking about you that way. So you've got to care more about them than you do about what they might think of you. Okay. Thank you, ladies. All right. Question number two. Um, If I'm going to think about sharing this, all of a sudden I'm stuck because who the heck am I even going to talk to? Like, I don't have a network. I don't know anybody. Like, where am I even going to start? So Laurel, you had no Facebook. How did you know who you were going to talk to? Or what do you do when you're talking to someone about the opportunity and they act like they have nobody to reach out to? Right. So like Christina said, I went all the way to Ruby with no social media, no, no, of no kind. And that is surprising for a lot of people. So here's what I did. I shared with people that I went to church with and I shared with people that I work with and I shared with um, people that were in the context of my phone. So if you take your phone right now and look <laughs> at how many contacts you had, y'all, I had 906 contacts in my phone. So I went through in alphabetical order, A through Z, backwards and forwards. So I went through my contacts twice. And that's how I built my, well, with the help of my team, to Ruby. And I told Terry, because she said, you're going to have to have social media eventually. And she was right, because when I needed to shout out um, someone on my team, I was, I had to use my mom's Facebook (laughs) That was challenging. So I said, okay, I've set myself a goal to when I reach Ruby, I will get social media. And that is when I started then reaching out to the friends on my Facebook. So, so yeah, so surprisingly, I had no social media. So I really leaned on the contacts in my phone, ABC order, backwards and forward. So do not tell me you have no one to reach out to because you can start there, your church, your workplace, your cell phone contact list. Absolutely. And I'm going to ask Jessa the same question. One thing I'll point out, I've had people tell me, I don't know who to reach out to. And I'll look and they'll have 2000 Facebook friends. So just know when they say that, what they're saying is not that I don't have anybody to reach out to. What they're saying is I don't believe enough yet to put myself out there with the people that I do know. So that's a mindset. And there's something that you can figure out what they're believing. It's usually a lack of belief in the products or themselves and help them overcome that. They're not actually saying, I don't have anybody to talk to. They're just saying, I don't, I'm not willing yet to put myself out there for these people. And so the work then becomes, why not? Like, what, do, like, tell me more. So, okay. So just the same question, who am I even going to reach out to? I have no network. I actually, um, the way I generally go when people are like, oh, I don't have anywhere. I'm like, okay, well. First, you have your mom, your sister, your brother, your uncle, your, you know, your immediate friends and family. And you know, plenty of them that have been praying for help with their digestive issues or their allergies, or, you know, those people better than anyone. But when you get through that initial list, that's generally when people are like, well, I've ran out of people. And I'm like, no, 
make a list of everybody you know that has digestive issues, allergy issues, eczema, psoriasis, all of the laundry list of things that you know Plexus can help them with by clearing up their gut and make a list of those people. And then make a separate list of the people that have kids that go to the ballpark with you and they, you know, you're on the same karate teams and you go to church together. You know, they're working multiple jobs. That person has already figured out they need a side hustle. So that's like a double whammy or a tired mom that would really love to stay home with her kids because she's too busy trying to keep up with them and work. This could be that for her. So I have several different lists that I help them go through, like as they tell me they ran out of people. Yeah, absolutely. And another pro tip is as they're coming up with their people, you're saying, okay, tell me about this person. How do you know them? Do you think they would benefit from the products, the opportunity or both? Okay, perfect. Based off of what you've just said, how do you want to approach this? And so you're empowering your person with your support so that you can say, okay, well, if this were my, my friend and they struggled with these things, this is the approach that I would take. Um, Yes, there is a leads you didn't know list um, generator. There is one in virtual office. I believe there's also one saved in freedom team. Um, there And there's lots of different list um, prompts. The Frank's list is another one. Friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, kids. I can't remember what the S stands for. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different prompts, but basically it's just to get you thinking of people outside of your normal sphere. So like, who are some friends that you know because your husband knows them? And now all of a sudden that, wires your brain to be thinking that way uh, for teachers like okay who do you know based off of kids you've taught in the past so just kind of um giving your brain some prompts okay well and christina i also when i get to a point with people that they're like okay well i've done everything and generally by that point i felt this way and i feel like most of the people that start building do get to this point you also learn that like you you don't know everyone you don't know what everyone's problems are so everyone needs plexus like literally we say that all the time but it's actually a thing this person looks super healthy and i think they have all the money they could possibly want well wrong you were healthy didn't you have super high blood pressure that was trying to kill you right. you looked healthy right i mean you lived in a nice house you had a good job right maybe you don't need any more money you don't know whether they need the products or the money or both until you've talked to them and odds are they actually probably need both of them yep Yep. I've only ever had one person in the history of the world tell me I have all the money that I need. And then she screenshotted me her bank account and she had uh, multiple millions of dollars in it. So that was the one. And it was a, it was a very interesting <laughs> conversation. And so then I'm like, but do you get to go on shopping sprees? I mean, I don't know, but that's only ever happened once. So, okay. Yes. Don't prejudge. Okay. Um, what if I reached out to someone and they say no, or they don't respond. Like, what do I do now? Because that must mean something about me. I must be doing this wrong or they, I, it's probably always going to be this way. No one's ever going to be open. What happens when someone says no, thanks, or they say nothing at all, Laurel. All right. So I said this earlier in the call, if people say no, it simply means not yet. So you can ask my level one, Jessica, she's on this call tonight. She told me no for two years, two years. And I never gave up on her because I knew she was meant, well, I knew she needed the products, but I knew she was meant for this business too. And she will soon be senior gold very soon. So I just kept following up with her. I mean, like Jessica said earlier, eight to 12 times, follow up, follow up, follow up. Jessica tells people that I reached out or followed up with her more than 12 times, but she finally said yes. So y'all, the, the fortune is in the follow-up and we say that and hear that all the time. People are praying for what we have, what we can offer them to help with their problems, a solution to their health problems, a solution to their financial problems. Um, we have what people need. So just follow up, follow up, follow up. No means just not yet. Absolutely. And there are ways to, Laurel, how did you find ways to follow up with her over 12 times in ways that weren't just, hey, are you ready for Plexus? Hey, are you ready for Plexus? Like, what did you do to build your skill set in the area of follow up? This is an extra question. Sorry. Well, she is a teacher just like me. 
And so, you know, conversation was easy between us. We've been friends for a long, long time. We've been business partners together. We ran a cheerleading program through the school together before. So I knew that she would be a great business partner. So I just kept building her belief in, in this opportunity. And she's getting ready to build a house and her extra um, income with Plexus is going to help with that. And that just makes me excited for her. Yeah. So you just continue to be a product of the product. You continue to talk about what you were excited about. She saw you continuing to be successful without her. Like you did not let her decision to do or not do determine whether or not you were going to keep going. And sometimes the most inspiring thing you can do for someone that you want to build this with you is go be successful without them. That's exactly what Brittany did. She started talking to me when she was a silver and I did not join her until she was a senior Ruby. So I watched though, I saw what she was doing. I knew that she wasn't waiting on me. And then I finally realized I better jump on this thing. So that's a great point. Okay, just the same question. What do you do if somebody says no, or they don't respond? What does that mean? It can mean a bunch of things, but it's completely normal. I mean, it's a numbers game, regardless of how you look at it. But how many times have you looked at your phone and you're like in the middle of changing the baby's diaper or in the middle of checking out at Walmart or whatever, and you're like, mm, I need to answer her back and you stick it in your pocket. And then life happens and you just don't. You genuinely didn't mean to not answer. But until someone prompts you and says, hey girl, did you get my last message? You, you're not gonna remember to message back. So don't assume that they're ignoring you because they read it and didn't respond or because they haven't read it. I get that a lot. Or people apparently don't have messenger. Like literally, I don't know how many red dots are on their phone, but it would not be a phone I could deal with because there's probably a lot of red dots on their phone. Um, it's just super normal. And also when you do talk to them and they say no, unknown is scary for people. If they say no, everything stays exactly the same. And even though they may not love where they're at, they may have digestive issues, they may have other things happening, they may be lack of or have lack of energy, but they know that and it's comfortable. Whereas if they say yes, things are going to change. That's money they have to cut from somewhere else. Or, you know, even if it is a positive change, people just don't always like change. They like to be comfortable. So you have to kind of remember that when you're talking to them and dig a little deeper. Okay, well, you know, what's holding you back from making this decision for yourself? You know, what's holding you back from putting your health first? And a lot of times they'll give you a very clear answer to help them along the process. Yeah. So I think, like you said, perspective is key. You have the choice to look at a message that has been read, but not responded to. You're the one choosing to believe that they're ignoring you. The, they're, they're, the, the um, result is not an ignore. And to ignore someone requires deliberate effort. You're making the assumption that that's what they're choosing to do. When in actuality, they just could have not gotten back to you yet. They could have intended to. They could have not even been the one who opened the message. Anybody with kids, like my poor messenger. Like if y'all have messaged me, just offer grace, okay? My kids open it. Sometimes they even respond. So that's even funner, but more fun. Um, just don't, don't assume. Don't assume. You don't have to make these things mean anything about you. Okay, we got to kick it into high gear. Okay, so product objections. Here's some objections that, stay the same. They never go away. If you become a master of handling these objections and overcoming it, it won't necessarily have to slow you down. So the number one objection we tend to get when sharing plexus is what everybody? Money. Yeah. It's too expensive. I can't afford it. And there's a lot of things that I want to say about this, but Laurel, when someone tells you I can't afford it, thanks, but I can't afford it, or it's out of my price range. What do you do? So I use um, what we've learned, the feel, felt, found. Um, and so I wrote down a sample message that I have used before. Something like I would say, if, if they think the products are too expensive or they can't afford them, I might say, I understand how you feel. I felt the same way. And here's what I found. If I go share with my mom, my best friend, and my grandmother, then I've made enough money to pay for the next three months worth of products. If I could show you, would you be open? And also, um, 
you know, I might say you also cannot afford to continue to pay those doctor bills and pay for those prescription meds that you've been taking for years and years and years. Um, so that's another um, way I might handle that objection. I love that. So you feel felt found it with sprinkling the opportunity. Another way is, you know, Hey, listen, I understand how you feel. When I first started taking a look at Plexus, I knew it was going to require an investment financially on my part too. And here's what I found. There were ways that I was spending money anyways, that I could just swap out to make this change. So I was already going and getting an energy drink, or I was already spending a two, you know, I know Brittany used to go to the store and get chocolate every day. Like I was already spending this money. And now I found that instead of wasting that money on stuff that's not serving my body well, I'm actually investing it into long-term health with me and my kids. Um, so, and then follow up that up with the question, like, you know, is there, are there places in your budget where you could make those adjustments? Because here's what you need to know. Most of the time, people can afford what they want to afford. Most of the time, there will be an exception every now and again, but the same person that's telling you, hey, I can't afford your products. And then the next day you're seeing sap and selfies of their Starbucks at the movies. What they're really communicating is you've not made the products valuable enough for me yet. It's not worth me giving my money to it yet, in my opinion. And so your job becomes grow their belief in the products. Help them understand that these products aren't something for them to just lose five pounds. Like we're talking about long-term overall health, digestive issues, migraines, allergies. Like you've got to paint the bigger picture of what these products can create for someone. Okay, Jessa, what do you do to overcome the it's too expensive objection? Well, you just said half of it. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> Um, but I do, I talk to them about preventative over prescriptions because you're going to spend it now or spend it later, regardless of how you look at it. Don't believe it. Call every 70 year old, you know, and ask them because they'll tell you, call your grandma. Um, but I also, we've already talked at this point before we get to, to money, we've talked about, do you have a lack of energy? Do you have sleeping issues? Do you have allergies? Do you, you know, have digestive issues? I already know what they've admitted to having a problem with. And normally like myself, like I started for digestive issues. I, I'm fine. I'm healthy. I work out all the time. I eat super healthy. There's, I'm already fit, but I have digestive issues. Then when I started the products, I'm like, actually, I do have a lot more energy now. Actually, my allergies went away. Actually, I'm sleeping a lot better, but I didn't join for any of those reasons. So I already have a list of things they've admitted to wanting help with, and I bring it back around. Imagine what your life would look like if you weren't struggling at two o'clock every day. Imagine how much more energy you would have to play with your kids at night after you get home from work and cook dinner, if you were sleeping better at night, you know, and I'll just kind of paint a picture for them of what their life could be like if we resolve some of the issues we talked about earlier, how much is that worth to you? How much is investing in your health worth to you when we're discussing it in a matter of spending better time with your kids or, you know, and I've already talked to them about cutting out energy drinks or you know, the Starbucks or whatever they're doing in place of right now. Right. So that brings me to a fantastic point. And if you're getting this objection about the cost before you've ever had the chance to educate them, um, build the value, just know you can take back control of that conversation. Just because someone's first question to you is, hey, how much is that plexus that you're posting about? You don't have to answer that right then. I always counter with, hey, thanks so much for reaching out. I would love to help find some products that will be a great fit for you. Why don't you tell me what your health goals are? What's keeping you from feeling your best every day? I'm going to take back control of that conversation and I'm going to follow my flow for how I share Plexus. They're going to answer the questions I'm asking. I'm going to clarify their answers. I'm going to use a resource and send a tool. I'm going to do all of that before I ever tell somebody the price of the products. Okay. Because I want them to understand the value before they see a price tag. It's kind of like a Louis Vuitton purse. If all you saw was a price tag and you had no idea what the big deal was with Louis Vuitton or how valuable, I don't know anything about purses. I don't know why I picked that, but how valuable it is or what the going rate is, or I don't know. If you didn't know anything about Louis Vuitton, paying that price for that purse would seem outside of this world, right? Right. But there are people who are willing to pay that because for them, it's valuable enough. So your job is to make the products valuable enough. Okay. What do you do when you're reaching out and somebody says, thanks, no thanks, I'm already healthy. Laurel, what do you say to somebody in that situation? 
Again, I would use feel, felt, felt, found. That's hard to say. <laughs> um, and I wrote down another sample message I have used before. Uh, no matter how much, uh, and it is kind of a little bit of my testimony, like no matter how much I exercise or was a healthy eater, the weight didn't come off. I still had the inflammation and I still had the high blood pressure before supplementing with Plexus products. So since supplementing, I would just tell them, since I take these supplements, I have less inflammation, lower blood pressure, the scales are going down. So I would just, you know, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. And here's what I found. No matter me doing this, this, and that, the doctor said lose 10 pounds. I did it without supplementing. I still had the high blood pressure. I love that. Yep. Feel felt found. It's a great way to handle an objection. Jessa, what do you say to somebody who says they're already healthy? I generally start with like myself, or I'll send them a picture of you prior to Plexus and a picture of you now. And I'm like, she's super fit now, but she was fit then. She was already healthy. Do you see a difference? Cause I sure do. Um, but just because you're healthy, just because I eat super clean, like if God didn't make it, I don't eat it. And I am very active, but that didn't solve my digestive issues. I was constantly having to cut things out and it wasn't working. And then the same thing with hormonal issues. I mean, how many people do you CrossFit with, well, you don't do CrossFit, but Nikki and whoever else, you know, how many people go to CrossFit every day? That's like hardcore, but they still have super bad hormonal issues. And it all comes back to your blood pressure. I mean, not your blood pressure, your blood sugar balance, which controls your hormones. So, you know, I just talked to them about the things that, especially try to target to what we've already discussed. Like if I know that they have some issues going on. And then I also send a picture of my allergy panel, because for me, that's the testimony that whether they have allergies or not, they almost always stop and listen. Then I was deathly allergic to like everything they tested me for. I had to carry EpiPens everywhere because literally all it took was a bee sting. And I mean, we're done. And I have not taken an allergy pill, an allergy shot. I mean, not using EpiPen since December of 2020. And I live in the middle of country bill. So I mean, that right there is normally enough for them to stop and say, okay, well, you know, I actually do have allergies, mm -hmm. even though I'm really healthy. Right. So right. I just kind of approach it that way. And then if I need to talk about preventative or prescription again, I do. Yeah, that's fantastic. I will tell you something else. Sometimes when you hear somebody that says, Hey, I'm already healthy. What they're saying is I don't have any medical diagnosis. They've just decided that tired as a mother is a real thing. They've just decided that pooping once every two weeks is just a normal thing. No doctor's ever diagnosed it as anything. So they think, well, I'm healthy. Like I don't have any diagnoses, diagnoses, whatever. So you would just ask the clarifying question. If somebody tells me I'm already healthy, not interested, I say, that's awesome. So like you're feeling your best every day and almost always they're like, well, no, like I don't feel my best every day. Like no one does. That's like not a real thing. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Tell me more. Um, so that's one thing that they're thinking sometimes. And then if you do have that rare specimen of someone who, who is actually feeling great every day, they don't have any major things going on. And then I always take the whole, let's maintain that route. A brand new car has no maintenance issues when you drive it off the lot. But if you want to keep it in prime shape, then there are some things that you must do to maintain that. You got to change its oil. You got to rotate some tires. Like you got to do certain things to keep it in that shape. And our body's the same way. Um, I mean, listen, once you're born, you're starting that downhill journey towards end of life, right? So we have a responsibility to maintain that and you can just offer that perspective. Um, there's a million other objections we could get into, but I want to respect y'all's time. So here's the number one thing. As long as your focus is on what is in this for them, not what's in it for me, not I really need an Apple watch. So I'm going to pressure, 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 pressure. That's not what we're about. We're about what are they believing that could be not true about themselves or these products or whatever? And what can we do to build their belief so we can replace that thought? And how can I posture myself that way so that I'm here to serve them versus sell to them? Are you a salesperson? Yes. Is there shame in selling? Absolutely not. Everybody everywhere is selling something. You go to a job interview, you're selling yourself, right? Like, we're selling things left and right. And we're also buying things left and right. So it's not that people don't want to buy from their friends. That's just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Um, 
So that brings us to the last objection. Um, and that is, what do you do if you're reaching out and somebody hits you with that whole no MLMs, thank you. Like they have, they're adamantly a gift, a network marketing company. What do you do then, Jessa? I always approach it in a simple, plain terms. So if you go to a big box store, you are coming home with an inferior product. You're still getting your, your probiotic, your energy drink, your vitamin, and you are supporting who? Don't worry, I'll wait while you tell me the, the owner's name of Walmart. Or you can support your friends and family who are being able to stay home with their child because of this, or they're being able to put the child through college because of this, or they're paying off their college debt because of this, or you're putting groceries on someone's table because of this and coming home with a superior product. And I can show you ounce for ounce why this one's better than the one you're getting at Walmart. And most of the time, people are not going to come back and say, well, I don't care if I'm putting groceries on your table. I don't care if I'm supporting Sally's little league team. <laughs> like people do care. They just think that because they purchase from an MLM, they therefore have to share it. And if you don't have a good feeling about an MLM, don't share it now. Let me change your mind over the next few conversations and we'll try again in two weeks to talk about you sharing. <laughs> Yeah. And one thing that I will say, if somebody comes back and they're just a hard nose, like no MLM, thanks though. I'll say, man, it sounds like you probably have had a tough experience in the past. Like I can relate. I have seen this done in ways that weren't super flattering. So listen, let me just take a chance, like on behalf of, of everyone who does what I do. If you've had a bad experience, like I apologize. That has not ever been our intention. Um, there's always going to be a bad apple in every bunch, like every profession, there's going to be someone who's not killing it. Right. And so I just want you to, I apologize. If you want to share your experience, I'm all ears. I would love to hear. Um, in the meantime, though, maybe like, let, let me share my heart behind what I'm doing. And I just take a chance to let them know why what I'm doing is different, why I'm not out to make a sale, but I'm out to literally just share what I'm excited about and why I thought of them. Um, and you guys, you can help put a, a good face on network marketing by reaching out the right way, taking the time to go and look at their social media, taking the time to try to figure out what you can connect on. You know, a bad way to make social media or network marketers look bad, be in somebody's inbox without taking the time to go to their Facebook page and find out that they had buried their dad that same day. Had I just taken a couple seconds and gone to mm -hmm. their Facebook page to see what was happening in their life, do you think that my connection with them might've been a little different? Yeah, yeah. Did it hold me back from eventually being successful? No. Did it paint what I do in a poor light for this particular person? Yeah, it did. So learn from these mistakes. I could have made it mean that I was not destined to do this, that I just was the worst of the worst. Instead, I took full responsibility and, and I learned. And so you can too. So um, Jessa, Laurel, thank you guys for being brave and bold and willing to come on here and just share your experience. Um, I have no doubt that this will not be the last that we see of you on here. The team learns a ton from hearing about people who are where they are at in their business. So very proud of you guys. Um, I hope this was helpful, you guys. I hope that as you're hearing objections, you're looking at them as opportunities. An objection is what you should be searching for every day. You should be excited when someone comes back with something because what it's saying, what they're saying is, I would be open if not for this. So if you help them address this and overcome this, now you have someone who is open. So don't let objections hold you back. See them as an opportunity and then ask questions from your upline, your leader, so that you can overcome them. All right, ladies, anything before we close out? Just so Laurel? No? Okay. Yep. All right, y'all. Well, I am so excited to see you guys go and close this month strong. Watch me grow. There's going to be lots of flashy Apple watches, I'm sure. All right, guys. See you soon. Bye, y'all.